thank you welcome everybody i really appreciate you joining today um as i just said if you can keep your cameras on and your, your microphones muted for now that'd be fab um it's a pleasure to welcome hannah buko manovich hopefully i haven't butchered your name hannah <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> Who's going to speak with us today. So Hannah is a chartered accountant with experience across a number of both listed and privately owned companies. Since 2021, she's been FD of One and All, which is a company that makes school uniforms. They are a 100% employee owned company and a certified B Corporation. So today, Hannah's going to talk a little bit about the role that finance plays in sustainability and getting that balance uh, between planet, profit and people. Um, we do want the session to be interactive. However, if any questions or insights that you'd like to share, we can wait until the end and then we'll kind of open up for discussion. That would be great. Um, and so with that, I'm going to mute myself and pass over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for the introduction. And thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining and taking time out uh, today. So the discussion topic is the role of finance in driving sustainability. So I will just share my slides. Can everyone see that okay? Um, so I work for One and All, as Chris said, uh, since 2021. We've been employee owned since 2016. Um, and since then, the company's really grown, both in turnover from 12 to 20 million, um, and also on its journey to be putting as much focus on people and planets as it does the bottom line margin. To demonstrate this, last year the company won the British Chamber of Commerce National Award for Community and it was also awarded Employee of the Year uh, by Greater Manchester Good Employment Awards. Uh, so today I'll be focusing on what's been become known as the triple bottom line of people, profit and planet. I'm not here to pass myself off as an expert <coughs> in all matters ESG more to share my experiences to start that discussion of, on what we in finance can do in our roles, which will uh, hopefully lead us to being able to share initiatives and ideas between us. Uh, the triple bottom line theory uh, expands conventional business success metrics to include an organization's contributions to social well-being, environmental health, and a just economy. So I'll first discuss the principles of ESG. Firstly, what I've finance department's role within this is and what the financial benefits of striving for a strong ESG culture are. I'll then draw on some of the focuses we have at our company, including B Corp and employee ownership model and also key initiatives. So in terms of the role of finance in ESG role, it's um, an ESG, ESG considerations have become increasingly important for businesses in terms of sustainability and long-term financial performance. The biggest specific ESG function or team in people's companies is depending on the size of the company. But regardless of who owns the solution, finance should be involved and collaborate across all areas to drive straight greater success. So we incorporate ESG metrics into the financial reporting and analysis. For those who were at last month's boardroom and listened to Paul's excellent presentation on KPIs, that's something which we can incorporate ESG into. You can consider adding ESG indicators such as carbon emissions, diversity and inclusion metrics, employee engagement and sustainability in the supply chain. Given that finance works across functions and various business units, finance is in a really good position to lead the organisation's ESG reporting and data management approach. Capital allocation. Within finance, we have huge influence on the capital allocation decisions to prioritize projects and initiatives that align with the company's ESG objectives. We need to consider ESG principles when choosing suppliers and consider the long-term impacts on investments. This is true for both fixed asset investments and also ensuring that the ESG strategy is supported by sufficient budgeting in the PL. Incentives. Finance leads can consider linking executive and employee incentives to ESG performance. 
consider incorporating the SD criteria into compensation and performance evaluation to encourage broader participation and ownership of ESG goals within a company. And finally, education and awareness. As FDs, we can educate the broader finance team and wider business about the importance of ESG considerations and really seek to encourage a culture that genuinely values these principles, not just as a reporting tick box exercise. It's not specifically about carbon emission stats um, or the reporting that makes the difference. It's about creating that cultural care um, and encouraging that within the department. These initiatives take time, resource and funds. So what are the benefits for business performance? So the first is cost savings. Many ESG initiatives, such as energy efficiency improvements, waste reduction, sustainable sourcing, can lead to significant cost savings over the long term. By reducing resource consumption, companies can operate more efficiently which positively impact the bottom line. For example, investing in solar technology, electric vehicle fleets, lights on timers, should all help the bottom line as well as the climate. Improved reputation and customer loyalty. Companies that prioritize the SG goals often enjoy a better reputation among consumers and investors. This positive perception can lead to increased customer loyalty and attract ethically minded investors, ultimately driving sales and enhancing the company's market value. We've certainly seen this in our own turnover figures with a really clear, consistent, ethical message which really connects to customers. Access to capital. As ESG considerations gain prominence in the investment community, companies that demonstrate um, strong ESG performance might find it easier to access capital Many banks now offer green loans and ESG linked loans. I was um, I attended the HSBC sustainability linked loan presentation a couple of months ago, and that's about um, the loans which link the interest rate to hitting clearly defined ESG targets. There was an example company there who used volunteer days and carbon emissions. The more they reduced it, they ticked that box, and it would impact their interest rate. Attracting talent. Businesses with strong ESG performance are more attractive to top talent, particularly among younger generations who value the purpose-driven work. Uh, for us, the retention of the key talent is very strong. We've not lost any key personnel that we wouldn't have wanted to lose since I've been there since 2021. And attracting talent becomes a lot easier. Like the last few appointment role appointments, one being my management accountant, had similar or even higher offers uh, from other companies, but they cited the culture and the purpose of the reason for choosing the company they did. Employee engagement and productivity. Companies that prioritize social aspects of ESG, such as employee well-being, diversity, and inclusion, tend to have higher employee satisfaction and productivity. A motivated and direct diverse workforce can contribute to innovation and operational efficiency to positively impacting profits. So I'll move now to the key specific models and initiatives we have, and I'll start with uh, B Corp. Uh, so B Corporations, it's a global network of companies who aim to balance profit with purpose. Notable B Corps uh, you'll have heard of are Patagonia, Able and Coles, the Body Shop, uh, Tom's Footwear, B Corp companies change their articles, articles of association with that limited company to require them to consider the impact of their decisions, not only on shareholders, but also on workers, customers, community, and environment. Uh, becoming a B Corp involves meeting specific performance standards, uh, and the certification process does require time and effort and resources. There's an annual fee for our company, 20 million turnover, it's about eight and a half thousand annual fee. So what are the advantages? Social and environmental impact. B Corps have a far more commitment to consider their impact on employees and the environment. And this helps to focus on and drive positive change. Secondly, B Corps are held to high standards of transparency and accountability. 
they must meet rigorous performance requirements and make their assessment results public. Each B Corp has a score out of 200. B Corps must reach a score of 80 to be certified. Um, our current score is 107, but we're hoping to be certified this year at about 130. And Patagonia is a brilliant company um, um, at um, one of the considered one of the best at 151. Um, all on metrics, all based on individual specific metrics. This transparency can build trust with customers, investors, and other stakeholders. Attracting purpose driven customers. Many consumers today are seeking out companies that align with their values. Waitrose now has a specific B Corp aisle section. Um, um, you're not putting into practice the initiatives for the purpose of increasing sales, but Aligning with consumers is always advantageous. Networking and learning, B Corps become part of a community of like-minded businesses, allowing for knowledge sharing and collaboration on social and environmental initiatives. Being a B Corp can help attract the talent that is interested in working for a company that prioritizes purpose. Employee ownership. Employee ownership is a model that can support a company's ESG focus. It can be done either through direct ownership through shares or via an employee and trust in EOT, where the shares sit in the trust for the benefit of the employees. There are now over a thousand EOT companies in the UK, and the number of EO companies has grown approximately about uh, at a rate of about ten percent per year. Most businesses to choose to go EO, choose to use the EOT model. It doesn't have to be done in one go. We became majority owned in 2016, employee owned, and 100% employee owned by 2020. And there's big tax advantages to this model with previous shareholders in terms of capital gains tax, and it can support succession planning. And some of the advantages to this model to align with sustainability goals are the tax-free profit share. As long as it's shared and split equitably, doesn't mean exactly the same, but equitably in accordance with the EOT rules, companies can give out up to £3,600 income tax-free per year per colleague. Last year, the minimum we paid to each colleague was £3,300, and which is a huge amount for those on the lower end of the earning scale, where in roles traditionally not associated with bonuses. Employee engagement. Ownership can help colleagues feel more engaged and proud, sense of belonging, increasing colleague happiness and attention. We have a vote of confidence in the managing director every three months that every employee participates in and with a chance to raise any concerns directly. And it promotes long term sustainable business decisions whilst facing the same challenges as non-employee owned uh, or key owned businesses, arguably there may be less external pressure for short-term goals at the expense of longer term ones. And also any profits not shared between colleagues can be 100% reinvested into the business rather than stripped out. Those trustees, we have both external and internal trustees, which oversee and monitor governance and board decisions and make sure the decisions are aligning to the values. I'm going to share some of the key initiatives. I recognise that all companies have different employee mixes and cultures, but just to share some of the things that we do here, um, ESG pensions are probably the biggest impact a company can make. Choosing a green pension, that's a pension fund that invests in companies that have strong ESG, credentials and aim for net zero 21 times more effective at cutting an individual's carbon footprint than adopting a veggie diet, uh, changing their energy supplier and giving up flying combined. And as that sees there's one measure that we can do to, which will positively impact the climate. And this is it to move the company away from the pension scheme, which maybe traditionally invests in companies with deforestation, fossil fuels, and towards companies aiming for net zero. Most pension providers are making it a lot easier to do now. Um, it has comparatively low costs and few downsides for either the company or, or employees. ESG pension funds have tended to outperform non-ESG funds over the past three years. 
in terms of climate change, as well as the certifications, the members of Planet Mark, reducing offsetting carbon emissions, um, also seeking to bring in colleagues and educate all colleagues of carbon literate, um, are certified carbon literate, and there's an annual half day climate crisis half day set of workshops to focus on climate initiatives, both at work and in the home and outside work, with a focus of making it really part of the company culture and owned by everyone. In terms of employee initiatives, now most of our workforce, we've got about 70 um, um, employees are traditionally in lower paid roles, such as warehousing and embroidery, embroidery positions. And therefore the key focus is to look at the pay and rewards through the lens of the lower paid. Firstly, the real living wage, which is £10.90 outside London versus £10.42 £10, um, uh, minimum wage. It increased by 10% last year due to inflation. In Greater Manchester, where we're based, and um, more than one in eight are paid below the real living wage. Most of these employees are female and the vast majority are black and Asian. One in four children in Greater Manchester in poverty and half of these have uh, working parents. Therefore, um, we feel like the real living wage is a, is a key initiative um, to encourage throughout the region. Pay differential. It's in our constitution that the top earner can't have a basic pay more than 10 times the lowest paid. And the overall ethos is the lower paid get well paid and the higher earners get paid fairly. And there's also a transparency in pay and levels for our colleagues. In terms of healthcare plan, we, we've not got an unlimited pot of money. We've not got uh, private uh, healthcare um, bells and whistles for all uh, colleagues. But, uh, we, but it's a plan, a pay care plan, which focuses on the key needs for those lower paid, covering the costs that some people just aren't able to meet at the moment, such as dental, private appointments, uh, video. Interest free loans. Um, we see it's, that it's not right if our employees were to get into a cycle of using loan sharks and payday lenders and the massive detriment to quality of life and costs of this. And we'd much prefer them to come to us. The average value is about £500, usually for a repair or an unexpected cost. But we've also given loans out to people getting into gambling or credit card debt. As long as the total amount doesn't exceed 10000 at any time in the tax year, it's, um, it's not considered a taxable benefit. The cost of the business is negligible versus the impact on the individual. And depending on the reason for the loan, we invite colleagues to attend money management discussions uh, surrounding the flame. One now long term colleague says that this marks the first time in his life we've been debt free. Uh, colleague surveys, as well as monitoring uh, colleague satisfaction, we've done lots of specific surveys in the last 12 months to check on the impact of the cost of living crisis. As a result, we paid a one off £500 EOT cost of living bonus uh, tax free to each colleague. Colleagues know they can access um, and no questions are asked £30 supermarket voucher if they do require it. Uh, most of these initiatives are relatively low cost from the company perspective, but overall has a really huge impact on the colleagues. Uh, the result for us has been exceptionally strong colleague satisfaction and attention, and not unlinked to this, we had record customer satisfaction and profits in 2022. So in summary, finance has a key role to play uh, in ESG initiatives, both on the practical reporting and the budgeting, but also looking beyond the box ticking and ensuring it becomes part of the culture of the company. Each company will have their own focus areas and initiatives which are most relevant to them. And this focus not only means that businesses can become a meaningful force for good in the community, but also likely to improve business performance. Um, Thank you for your time. And if anyone has any questions or anything that, they, uh, that can be shared uh, from their experiences, it would be really welcome. Thanks, Hannah. That's really, really interesting. Really interesting. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, questions or insights that people would like to share. Hmm. No, 
I did have a question actually. Um, and it might be a really basic question, but I don't really know too much about any of this stuff. You know, when you talk about the balance of profit versus people and planet, is there a percentage that you're allowed to make or not allowed to make when you're a B Corp or are there any rules? You know, like non-profit, you're not you're supposed to reinvest everything. Is there any sort of rules on that or well, B Corps are for profit companies. They're not um so and there's and B Corp have a list of criteria. They've got this point system of, of, of sort of 200. They don't sort of say you've got to get an exact number on each category um, to become a B Corp. So you could have everything, all your good stuff uh, focused on employees and you probably still make the grade. So there's no set criteria requirement. Um, I think they feel it's more, more, more holistic, more... Um, um, and it can tr- attract a wider range of um, wider range of companies. I mean, B Corp, because your B Corp, it doesn't make you ethical. There's, you know, you can, there's arguments of it, if it's greenwashing. Nespresso jumped on board, and there was lots of um, sort of discussions on that. But it's really about um, formally um, looking at your commitment to uh, to that to that balance. Yeah. Cool. Anna, could I ask a question, please? Uh, what's the take upon your interest free loans? In the last year, so we've got 70 staff. I think I've approved about eight or seven or eight. Usually, um, because we have profit share, um, we tend to link the repayment in that month of profit share. Um, which obviously makes it either or we'll do it over sort of six months. So um, there's, it, it's it's a good, I guess it's a good 10 to 15 percent. Uh, but we feel that the value to us is fairly negligible. It, we we feel people don't don't abuse it, but we would say no if it was for a no new car or something. It, it it's uh, um, but they tend to be fairly small value. It's usually repairs. It's usually car problems, things like that. Yeah. We, it, um, it, it's uh, um, it's it's a good thing to I think it's a good thing to have that to uh, flag your intentions as a company uh, without costing the business too much. And I mean, it's it can be really powerful. I mean, it, so last week, the last one I approved was for a thousand pounds, and it was for it was last week, and it was for a mum whose daughter had been diagnosed with leukemia, and she had unexpected costs. You know, she. So she was. She had. She had those. Um, you know, cost of God, going in and out of hospital. The value to sort of someone to be able to do that in a, in a company, you know, quite low cost words, but you know, the value for her is, you know, you can make an immense difference. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you. Tracy, did you want to say something? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah, for going through all that. I just my question's more of a basic one, really, in terms of what um, were the key metrics you used to to measure your progress um, on on the ESG front. Because the, my, my experience is that most people f- um, focus on kind of carbon emissions and reducing the carbon footprint. But obviously, it's so much more than that. So I just wondered what your what metrics you use to make sure that you've got the right balance across all of the all of the categories. That's a really good question because I think one of the issues with the SG is it at the moment it's still quite blurry what constitutes and I think there's going to be a lot more um, requirements and financial reporting rights to be a lot stricter. Um, I guess we're we're certified with a number of organisations which require very um, concrete um pieces of information each year which helps us track and which we put in our annual reports such as co2 um emissions um you know we're planet mark certified in terms of employees we do the employee we do an employee survey every six months to monitor sort of colleague happiness uh the same with that we do um tier one uh supply chain tracking and we do audits within most of our most of our work in bangladesh uh, of our tier one suppliers and we do a lot of audit tracking then um so it's it i guess there's no holistic um tracking it's all individual it's all sort of individual employees suppliers um and on climate 
Thank you, Dave. Can I just add to that? Do you um, separately have a budget for ESG kind of metrics, reporting, tracking, all of that, all of it? From, well, I suppose from the end to end, or 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 are you still have you still got it as a little bit of a off the side of the desk activity that you're trying to integrate? Hmm, I guess it's we do have a sustainability department, albeit a department of one and a half, but. Um, where those costs are budgeted a lot of our costs um we do we do separately track them uh, per year so what we what um is the additional cost because we we because um of the esg initiatives for example we uh we um transfer to using better cotton uh, bci cotton rather than non uh, bci cotton in the last years, we've got specific costs for that. Um, and obviously, you, things like donations, we see the donation budget as more of a donation target, We don't, which is slightly different than everything else we budget for. So it, it depends on the expense. It depends on the um, whether it's a capital expense or a P&L expense. Um, but it's, it's not one big pot of ESG, but we do try and track it it's to say, what have we spent overall on donations in ESG? Um, spend. Thank you. Thank you. Louise? Hi, yes. Um, I don't know whether you um, mentioned this earlier, Hannah, the size of your business or whether you're, you're located in the Manchester area. We, I work for a B Corp business and we still with the employee engagement aspect because our employees are all across the country. How do you, how do you apart from the fact that you're an employee, Owned trust, which kind of gives you that engagement. How do you deal with the softer side of engagement, and in this world of kind of virtual meetings and things? So uh, you're absolutely right. We're in, uh, we're in Greater Manchester. It'd be great to connect. Um, we're in Stockport, so um, most of our colleagues uh, are office based, or or at least two or three other days. Albeit we do have overseas colleagues, um, but I think the key thing for us is that. Co- is that culture of um, warmth and care, um, which I think all make, makes pe- people feel, uh, which, which really massively impacts on mm. um, on colleague happiness and retention. We've got a really um, focus on emotional intelligence, I guess, in the business. And in terms of, um, I've never been somewhere so much which has got such an open feedback culture as mm. well which really when there's a problem between um, colleagues with colleagues it's very open it's, it's dealt with it's discussed it's uh so it, 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 there's um i guess we use slack a lot we use like, a lot of videos a lot of uh, direct messages so that even overseas colleagues um feel feel connected we, we do try and have uh, regular meetings. Um, sorry, there's a bit of noise in the background here, apologies. Um, but it's trying to get them all on that call, to get them all feel part of it. And it, sometimes you have to, it's trying to dragging people to the party sometimes a little bit. As much as you, we do all those things and all those positive things when you're so disparate, um, it's sometimes quite difficult to get that full engagement from everybody. And it's making sure that people that don't turn up regularly, they're, that you're, you're staying in touch. And that's a bit, been a bit of a challenge for us as a national, with a national employee base. Yeah, I guess that's hard. I guess, I guess with everyone's companies, I'm sure we do, that we all do the same. There's things which are group initiatives and some things you have to, have to be dissipated between teams and you have to rely on that leader, that, that leadership goes down to the team leaders and um and they and they really sort of push that message on their own teams which who may not come to the come to the overall company events yeah i like that term emotional intelligence as well it's one that's not used often enough i don't think not in the no not in the accounting world <laughs> no <laughs> thank you I just was going to say as well i think it's something that it's not it's not something you can just kind of say and play at is it it's you know, like a, t- a checkbox exercise, you know, you've, and I think the leadership from, from what I know of, of your company, it really does come from the top, doesn't it? I mean, I remember you telling me it's not just about the people within your organization. It was, it's through the supply chain and wasn't it one of the suppliers in, in Bangladesh and they didn't have f- clean water. So they one and all supplied them with water filters. Yeah, no, you can make such a massive positive difference on 
initiatives which actually don't don't cost which are comparatively quite small so yeah all having clean water filters for families in an area where there's so much disease because of dirty water um being able to ensure that we're paying fair wages in um in egypt which have seen um inflation absolutely lock it. it 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 it's um i'm listening to people's stories and and uh, how it's impacted them it's um yeah it, it, it's quite powerful but i think you've got to really believe in it and you've got to really care about it because i guess you know it, it's one thing doing it for the people that are in your immediate vicinity in your organization but to go then beyond into kind of the you know your suppliers I just think that's amazing and I think it's something where it's, it's got to be a real want to help and put that above making money and I think that and I think the challenge in finance is we do want to make money um we all <laughs> that's definitely a goal um and um the challenge is balancing it because we can't do everything we can't it's not an unlimited pot of money and Cash and profit don't always align, and cash is king. So, so, and and I guess that's been my challenge over the last few years has been um, uh, balancing that, uh, knowing that, uh, for example, um, you know, everyone was here last year with the sort of inflation increases and in wages. We'd love to give everyone a ten percent pay pay increase, but uh, but just because the real living wage increased by ten percent, we can't. Um, so it's all that, that's a challenge on finance as well as balancing it. Yeah, that's been really, really interesting. I don't know if anyone else has got anything they'd like to add. Um, I've got maybe five, five, ten minutes, or, or if not, John. Sorry, sorry Chris, just uh, following on, I think Ian made a comment in there about retention, staff retention. I think that's something I'd be quite interested to hear, and I don't know if you've, if if you feel like the whole mission. I spoke to someone recently, and they were working for. Um, a, a company with a really strong social value and, and they found that retention wasn't as easy as you would imagine uh, in this day and age given the the strong sense of purpose within the indis- within the organization i'm not just be interested to hear about yourselves we uh, our retention's been really strong i mean i can only talk from the last sort of few years and we've not lost any um sort of in terms of key Above team lead level, we've we've not lost anyone that wasn't already on sort of a managed managed pathway. Um, and I remember when I started, the managing director saying to me, "You know, you've got a really strong finance manager. She, um, oh, she she's she'll she'll be she'll be with us for for years and years. You don't need to worry about uh, um, your finance manager leaving." And I thought, how can you say that? You know, people, like. I, you, you, you can't you can't guess at someone's sort of future plans but actually the long I'm here really I think there's I'm not expecting anyone to leave um out of sort of key personnel um who won't be on the retirement pathway in the next few years it is but I think people um um it, it, it's that love of their job uh but it it's been really good for us but it depends on the industry it depends on um it depends on the company it's it's not easy though yeah no no thanks very much ian i was just going to follow it up up on that comment basically about um retention of staff because we're a subsidiary of an american company and they're very focused on what happens in america Mm -hmm. and we cover the whole of europe so we've got people all over the place but our vp who is in charge of everybody over here has really improved the um the benefits that people get so like health insurance putting pensions in place and various other factors and since we've done this in each of the countries our staff leaving has zero has gone to zero so it, people potentially could get larger salaries elsewhere but from a retention point of view that isn't necessarily why they necessarily want to go there are other factors and i think this is a big extension of that so not only are people buying into what the company is about so there's um a cultural fit with those employees with your company and what they're trying to do, but also they're realizing that the company can help them in various ways and gives them a satisfaction, which maintains better retention and also motivates the staff because they feel they're working in an environment that is um, a positive environment. So I think it's a really good 
um, policy that you've got in place, this whole um, thing? Oh, it sounds like your uh, your VP is sort of making the right moves, and it's it's about practical benefits as well. It's it's about that whole package, which I'm sure we we've all got to that ba uh, balance, but definitely. Um, and for us, I think hours and flexibility is massively important. So I'm a four day a week sort of some short finish uh, early finish um, FD, um, and I don't think there's many companies which would offer that. Um, and uh, and it, cer it certainly helps with um, uh, sort of offering those the staff the flexibility. If it works, there'd be plenty of requests I've said no to in my in um, my team. If it doesn't work, um, it's all part of that full package. Well, I think the company are doing a lot right, Hannah. I really do. <laughs> Pl plenty. Well, uh, I think yes, there's always plenty of uh, room, room for development. Oh, I think it's been really interesting. Thank you so much. I'll um, I'll take it that there's no further questions. You will. Are you happy for us to share the slides, Hannah? At the end. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we'll um, you'll get a follow up email from us. Oh, we have um, uh, just to say we um, we did a fair bit of working in 2022 on an impact report. I don't know if anyone is currently building an impact report. That's what your own companies are doing. If anyone would like a copy just for um, interest sake or. Uh, to review, really happy to pass on. Perfect. Thank you. Um, no, really, really good. I really appreciate you taking the time to prepare and to present. It's been really interesting. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, obviously, we do these every month, a different subject matter each month. Um, hopefully, you're all part of our FD and CFO network on Guild. Um, if not, there'll be details of that on the follow-up email as well. It's just a place where you can all um you know ask questions from each other it's, it's purely fd cfos i think we're just short of a thousand members across the uk um and it's a resource that's you know really positive and useful uh for you guys to kind of network with other fds and cfos um so yeah if you could send the slides and the impact report to to me hannah we'll make sure that gets distributed Perfect. to everyone thank you so much thank you so much for having me have a great rest of the day guys thank you thank you